It's, uh, it's great to see everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening. My name is Matt Tremolin. I'm the Vice President for Institute Advancement at RPI. I want to start out by thanking you for joining us here in Boston for our panel discussion on translation, innovation, and entrepreneurship. We're going to get started with the program, and we'll begin with some introductions and hear from each of our experts with us this evening as they speak about translation, innovation, and entrepreneurship before having a collective conversation about how we can all contribute and invest in these areas. Following the conversation, we'll, we will have a Q&A and an opportunity for more discussion and networking at the reception. I'd like to briefly recognize our moderator for this evening's conversation, Dawn Fitzgerald, uh, who's a member of the class of 1987 uh, and mother of two alumni from the classes of 2018 and 2022. So you'll hear more uh, about Dawn from me as well as hearing from Dawn shortly. Uh, it is now my honor to introduce our 19th president of RPI, Dr. Martin Schmidt of the class of 1981. Prior to his arrival at RPI just a year and a half ago, Dr. Schmidt served as the provost of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Schmidt was also MIT's senior uh, academic and budget Very officer nice. responsible for the Very Institute's nice. educational programs, as well as the recruitment of, promotion of, and granting tenure uh, for faculty. Not a small job. Uh, Dr. Schmidt was a member of MIT's Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science faculty. He served as director of MIT's Microsystems Technology Laboratories and associate provost, and is a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. A seasoned researcher, inventor, and entrepreneur, Dr. Schmidt holds more than 30 issued U.S. patents and has played a part in starting seven companies. Dr. Schmidt earned his BS degree in electrical engineering from RPI. He earned his SM and PhD from MIT, both in electrical engineering and computer science. It is truly my pleasure to welcome the 19th president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Dr. Marty Schmidt, class of 1981. All right, well, thanks, Matt. And uh, thank you all for being here. Um, this is uh, just as a context setting. One of the things we're trying to do with this session is really, and, and the sorts of sessions that we hope to do on a regular basis, is give you some sense of things that we're cooking on campus and, and have provided an opportunity for our alumni, folks that are close to RPI, to um, share with us your thoughts about you know, the trajectory we're taking on. So that's, that's uh, one thing I want to say. The other thing I would say is that, so this is the second. Uh, we did this in, in New York City about a month ago, um, but this is the first time we're doing this in 2024, which of course is our birth year, um, mm -hmm. 200 birth year. And so you get to be exposed to us rocking our new Bicentennial logo. Um, that, that is a 200. Yeah. <laughs> In honesty, it took Mrs. Schmidt a while to warm up to the notion that it's a 200 and the zero is a Mobius strip uh, for, for the nerds in the audience. Um, but we're really excited about that. And uh, this is not a shameless, well, it is a shameless advertisement. Um, if, you, if you Google Rensselaer RPI bookstore, um, there's swag you can purchase with the logo on it now, whether it's t-shirts, uh, <laughs> uh, whatever, whatever you, uh, strikes your okay. fancy. Yeah. So, so anyway, um, so let me give you the context. So we're in the midst of a strategic planning process. Our goal is, uh, the board of trustees of RPI meets in, re in a retreat in March. Our goal is to use that. Uh, meeting as a chance to sort of finalize some of the things that we envision as part of our strategic plan. Um, when we started the process of strategic planning, I put together a set of working groups on campus and asked them to focus on five themes. Education, research, I'm, I'm looking because I forget, uh, <laughs> regional engagement, um, building and welcoming an inclusive community, and the topic tonight, which is translation. So what do we mean by translation? Well, you might say it's entrepreneurship, it's starting new companies. What we like to think of it is, is it's about how do we take the great ideas that are germinated on the RPI campus by the RPI students and faculty, how do we make sure those ideas have a chance of going out and having impact in the world? So we use the phrase translation, the process of translating that idea and taking it out to have impact in the world. 
Now, RPI has a great history in that regard. There are a number of our alumni who have been incredibly successful in that pathway, a number of ideas that have emerged from RPI that have had tremendous impact. Uh, one of my predecessors, the 14th president of RPI was George Lowe. He was the president when I was an undergraduate at RPI. He signed my diploma. It's proudly displayed in the president's office. George was an innovator and he created the incubator on the RPI campus. And it's, it's told, and I'm, I'm sure it's true, that it was the first incubator on a university campus in the United States. So a real pioneer. We also, uh, he also created the Tech Park in uh, North Greenbush, which is, was intended to be a place where once things were incubated on the RPI campus, they could go and grow in the Tech Park. And that happened. Um, some famous alumni like Sean O'Sullivan, who created a company called Map Info and ultimately sold it to uh, Pitney Bowes of all companies, but it actually was the predecessor of Google Maps. Um, and so there were a number of successes that traced their roots to those seeds that George Lowe planted with the incubator, with the tech park. As you, as you fast forward to today, what you find is that we have a, there is actually a startup ecosystem in downtown Troy. There is a cluster of computer gaming companies that really have their lineage going back to the Bala brothers who started a computer gaming company, sold it to Activision, used the proceeds of the sale to create an incubator for computer gaming startups in downtown Troy and a fund. Um, and so along the way, RPI created a Center for Technological Entrepreneurship. And in 1999, uh, Paul and Kathleen Severino uh, funded that and it's now the Severino Center. We also have a class called the Innovator, In Inventor Studio in the School of Engineering. Our Dean of Engineering is right here, Shekhar Garde, which has been very instrumental and helpful for some of our more recent entrepreneurs. But a lot has changed in the world and the, way, in, in the ways in which ideas get translated out of campuses. And this moment, this moment in our strategic plan is an opportunity to reimagine what should RPI do today? What George Lowe did in the 80s with the incubator and the tech, uh, tech park was clearly the right thing to do at the moment. But it's a different world. It's a different way in which ideas are translating. And what we're in the process of doing is really trying to ideate around what should our play be. Um, the thing that I view as sort of our shortcoming but also our opportunity is in some respects, uh, we, we have some core elements of what one needs to do to support translation, but our innovation system at RPI is not as dense as, for example, the system that I was experiencing at MIT. So you'd say, okay, well, we're, maybe we're lagging there. But on the other hand, um, there are legacy elements of some of these innovation systems that exist at other campuses that we don't, we're not encumbered by. So RPI has this opportunity, in some respects, to leapfrog to create a purpose-built structure to support the translation in today's world. Um, to do that, we recently announced the creation of an Office of Strategic Alliances and Translation, something we call OSAT. Um, this is an office that will support some of our major partnerships with industry, because as many of you may know, industry today plays a very large role in the creation of, in, the, in the support of startups. Um, we're putting our technology licensing office in that office because that is a big part of how you do this translation, which is how are you managing intellectual property? Our entrepreneurship center, like the Severino Center, will be part of this organization. And then the real estate activities in, tech, in the tech park as well as in downtown Troy will be part of it. And you'll hear from John Dordick, who is a, an entrepreneur and a founder, who is uh, a faculty member, a very accomplished faculty member at RPI, who we've tapped to lead that. So tonight's panel is, first of all, to give you a sense of what's happening at RPI today. And to do that, you're gonna hear from two emerging entrepreneurs, uh, and Quasha Murray, who's a graduate student, who is also in the midst of, in addition to doing her PhD, starting a company. Um, you know, typical slacking graduate student at RPI. Uh, and Alex Samus, who's a faculty member in architecture, who's doing some really innovative work in Brooklyn in the built environment, who's also contemplating how to translate his ideas out. And so we'll learn about what they're doing. And I want to caution you, this is not a pitch deck. We're not trying to raise money, but we're trying to give you a sense of what's happening on the ground at RPI. Um, 
John will come up and talk to you about um, what we're trying to do, our vision for this office that uh, he's building. And then Dawn has been with us in this journey. She's talked with all of your panelists and we've asked her as an alumni, as an entrepreneur with a lot of industrial experience to reflect on what we've shared with her and also her own thoughts about where we should go as RPI. And then we're gonna open it up and we wanna hear your thoughts. What should RPI be doing based on your experience? Many of you bring tremendous experience that's relevant to tonight's topic. And our goal is to have you learn what we are doing and to engage you in this topic and get your ideas. So with that, I thank you. Hand it over to Matt. All right, thank you very much, uh, Marty. Now I'd like to introduce Anquisha Murray, a PhD candidate in biology at RPI. Anquisha is co-advised by Dr. Wayne and Dr. Uh, Dordick. Again, you'll hear from John a little bit later. Um, and she was awarded the National Institute on Aging Training Program and Alzheimer's Disease Clinical and Translational Research Training Grant. And Quenxia attended Brown University as an NIH post uh Research Education Program Scholar in the Department of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology. She received her bachelor's degree in bi biological sciences with a concentration in microbiology and immunology with a minor in American Sign Language and Dance from the University of Rochester. Again, very impressive. So please uh, welcome uh, Ann Quasia. Thanks for the introduction. So as you mentioned, my name is Ann Quasia. I'm a, a PhD candidate at RPI, and I'm very excited to be here today speaking with so many alumni. And I will say I can't wait until I can say I'm an alumni as well, hopefully soon. <laughs> um, but I'll be talking today about some of the work I'm doing at RPI titled Improving Alzheimer's Disease Patient Outcomes Through Research and Innovation. So um, as you mentioned, I am um, co-advised by Dr. Chan Yu Wong and Dr. John Dordick. My thesis work involves investigating protein-protein uh, interactions in Alzheimer's disease and neuroinflammation. And I have a background in microbiology and immunology, as you mentioned, and somehow I joined a biochemistry biophysics lab, which I'll talk more about my research in a bit. Um, but I'm from Rochester, New York, so I went to U of R for my undergrad and, and then did the post back at Brown, and then lived in Canada for a year before I started my PhD here at RPI. Um, and since starting my research in Alzheimer's disease, I uh, became a trainee for the National Institute on Aging Grant, which was a great opportunity for me because they really it really promotes like um, inter interdisciplinary um, studies as well as a lot of personal uh, professional development courses. And this is when I was able to really get into biomedical innovation. So I have a background in business. I started a nonprofit in a single member um, LLC before starting my PhD, but through the training program, I was able to take a course called Biomedical Commercialization, and this was a collaborative course through RPI and Mount Sinai. And in the course, I realized that scientists engage in business. And this is the, real, the first time I really had that realization. I thought either I was a scientist or I did business. I always thought business was something I did on the side. But it was the first time that I realized that I can combine my love for science and my interest in business. So from there, I went on and really um, and tried to engage with the Alzheimer's disease community. I'm a communications chair for one of the professional interest areas for the Alzheimer's Association called um, Elevate Early Career Dementia Researchers with the initiative to really expose uh, research scientists um, to different funding mechanisms um, assist with job opportunities and so forth. And that has also allowed me a lot of opportunities to engage with the Alzheimer's disease community. So this is where I try to explain my research in like one minute, so bear with me. <laughs> so essentially I um, look at two proteins, uh, cyclophilin A, which is a protein that uh, functions with uh, protein folding, phosphorylation, and trafficking, as well as the protein tau, and tau is known as one of the pathological hallmarks for Alzheimer's disease. So essentially, I characterize the interaction of those two proteins and see what effect that has on neuroinflammation in the context of uh, microglia activation. So I do that in two ways. One is a technique called NMR, which is being shown to the right, where I look 
identify the binding site of one protein and the other, and that allows me to make claims such as cyclophilin or tau binds to cyclophilin A at these specific residues. And I also look at it from a cell-based perspective, and I see the localization of the tau being uptaken as well as how that results in neuroinflammation. So my research really allowed me to or gave me the interest to engage with the Alzheimer's community even more and see, okay, I do very basic science research, but you know, what does this disease mean to people? Really getting out of the building and engaging with the population. So from there, I was able to come across a lot of the burdens associated with Alzheimer's disease that I didn't previously realize. One is, you know, um, as humans, we're living longer, which is great but aging and age-related diseases are only gonna become more prevalent. So this is showing the cause of death from um, 2000 to 2019, and as you can see, there's a huge increase in deaths associated with Alzheimer's disease. In addition to that, there's a huge burden on care. There's not enough memory care facilities, assisted living homes, or caregivers trained to interact with the Alzheimer's, uh, people with different forms of dementia, really. So doing this, uh, one of the biggest burdens I've come across is the effect on caregivers. So it's already very expensive for people to provide care to their loved ones, but then what if you're the at-home caregiver and what supports do you have? Um, are you getting assistance with funding? Is there a community you can go to and rely on and find support? And what you see is a lot of the caregivers are extremely burnt out and they're looking for some lifeline. And recently there's been new treatments that's been available, but for a long time there wasn't. So what do you do? Where is the hope? So that um, essentially led me to feeling really passionate about this uh, pain point and then thinking what can I do with my knowledge base um, in order to have an effect on this community. So I did something not related to my research, which is develop um, a new venture called Agicare. So this is an AI-based platform aimed at improving um, AD patient outcomes. And when starting this project, the hypothesis that we were really working with is that there is currently no all-encompassing digital system established for tracking cognitive decline or evaluating drug efficacies outside of the clinical setting. Again, aimed at the fact that there's no treatment for or cure. There's a few treatments now or cure for Alzheimer's disease, as well as one of the biggest issues that we came across is with the at-home caregiver, sometimes they would transition from mild cognitive impairment to dementia, and then they start having behaviors, and some, it's sporadic. You don't know what's gonna happen. So from there, um, we pivoted a few times, as you know, <laughs> new companies do, but we started developing this point of care software for caregivers aimed at um, leveraging patient data to drive disease diagnosis and recommend com uh, patient-specific combination drug therapies. And to do this, we're using machine learning and AI technologies. And what we plan to do is have uh, aspects of it for the patient that involves gamification, different memory tests via application, as well as for the caregiver where they can input certain things that they're observing. And then our software will feed information as well as specific trainings and resources for them as well as data integration for physicians with different tests that's conducted while they're um, being seen with their geriatrician. And then also in the future, an uh, element for researchers to go in and be able to analyze this data aimed at developing new drug targets to combat Alzheimer's disease. So to do this, um, I was taking the uh, biomedical commercialization course and I had this idea. And I go to my colleague and I'm like, so I have this idea, don't you wanna like participate? And then he was like, of course, cause you know, <laughs> he's great. So I um, dragged Nathan in and we've been working on this venture together. And because this is, um, venture isn't related to what I do in lab, we really needed to find a resource that can help with the machine learning and AI uh, component of it, and luckily we went to a faculty member that we, we took his um, genetic engineering course and was like, this is what we're interested in doing. We are very passionate about bringing this project to life, and he was like, I love the idea, I absolutely wanna help, and we've been working on this for um, about a year so far. 
So um, right now we're doing a lot of customer discovery. We're actually in regionals right now. We have registered as an LLC. And right now, um, our, the biggest thing we're doing is developing an MVP. So we plan to have one by the end of the semester. And RPI has really helped with this initiative as a team of three and two being PhD candidates and the other one being a faculty. We were very time limited and really needed to source out. And um, based on different programs at RPI, we have actually been able to grow our team to six including a, a marketing course that's gonna help assist with the marketing, which is another team of SIDS. So we really have been able to leverage the resources at RPI to um, bring this to life. And next we plan on uh, applying for different funding mechanisms. So I just wanna highlight here some of the key things that I feel really propelled us. One is the ecosystem. And I kept hearing that, that word, like getting involved with the ecosystem. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what that means. And it really just takes one person. For me, that was Heidi and was like, okay, I see what you're trying to do. Let me introduce you to this person. Um, what are your needs right now? How can we help? And then from there, it's, it just spiraled out. And I think that's the great thing about um, the Capital Region in Troy is once I joined the ecosystem, I started to see the connections and the webs, and I've really been trying to access all of those resources to bring this technology to life. So I wanna highlight our um, Lally School of Management, as well as uh, UAlbany and the different um, i programs that we engaged in. And of course, my advisor that um, I went to and was like, hey, I'm gonna have that paper done, but also <laughs> I wanna do this as well and um, supported me in those endeavors. And with that, oh, and that's all. Thank you very much, Ankasia. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Alexandro Samas, an architect and assistant professor at the School of Architecture at RPI. Dr. Zama serves as the graduate program director of Built Ecologies, MS and PhD programs, and he is the associate director of the Center for Architecture, Science and Ecology, or CASE. He earned his PhD in architecture, design and computation, and his master's degree in design and building technology from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Zamas previously served as the post professional graduate program director in design at the Adolfo Ibanez University in Chile. He has also taught at MIT and the Knowlton School of Architecture at Ohio State University. Please welcome Dr. Zamas. Thank you very much for the, for the um, introduction. So I'm Alex Tamis, I'm, I am the Associate Director of uh, CASE, the Center for Architecture, Science and Ecology. Um, we are located in uh, Brooklyn, uh, New York, so we are an off-campus uh, campus from RPI, and we have been in the New York City area for the past 15 years. The idea is if you want to innovate uh, in the areas of the, of the built environment, you have to be closer to where things are happening. Um, CASE is an institute-wide research center. Uh, that's a mechanism that RPI has to instigate and to sustain research that cuts across different disciplines. We do not belong to the School of Architecture. We belong to the Institute as a whole. And our mission is to create projects that will uh, occupy every corner of RPI. Why is that? Because the biggest challenges that we're facing today, they do not belong to any specific discipline. Nobody specifically can handle all of it. So the mechanism that RPI has developed for this is that it, the, RPI is making us have to collaborate with everybody else in other departments to create projects that are bigger than one discipline can uh, handle. Um, the building industry is the largest contributor of, uh, of carbon. So 40% uh, of the carbon emissions is because of this sector, because of the way we build our cities and because of the way we sustain our cities. So in order to tackle this climate crisis today, we have to address the building industry as a whole. 
And uh, the case is doing exactly that. We're doing work with energy, we're doing work with new materials, we're doing work with uh, uh, information, uh, artificial intelligence, and so on, in order to understand how moving forward we can sustain the population growth that exists in the world and we can and we can accommodate the urbanization that is taking place everywhere in the world uh, without damaging the environment um, uh, today i'm going to talk to you about one initiative that is um, specifically happening around the way we deal with materials and construction methods in in for the built environment we call this the city to city initiative and it is a collaboration that started between case and the Manufacturing Innovation Center, which is a center in mechanical engineering at RPI. Um, our, our, our goal is to be able to, uh, again, occupy every department in order to understand how we can build the cities of the future using environmentally benign material. Uh, we are using hemp as an example of, the, of a material that we can use for the built environment exactly because it was legalized in the United States in 2018. So there was already a, an, an economic interest in it. So there, is an, uh, so there is an interest from the federal government and from the states to create economies around this material. So it's a great opportunity to see how those can translate into materials that can be used in the built environment. So in the city to city, we essentially look at all the mechanisms and all the processes and all the technologies that are need to take place in order to connect the supply of a raw material that is grown in a field like hemp all the way to the to the uh, the way we build cities and infrastructure the way we uh, we have components that can be used to um, to create our buildings so we do things like fundamental material science uh, we characterize materials and their properties. We test new materials and their properties. We look at manufacturing, advanced manufacturing methods like additive manufacturing or robotic manufacturing for modular construction. We look at designs of, of uh, systems and the way they would assemble together. Uh, we look at uh, what kind of infrastructure would farmers require in order to create cooperations, in order to to create an economy around this material from the farmer's perspective. Uh, we are looking at supply chains. This is a material that is sensitive because it is growing and every year the weather is slightly different. So how can we create um, supply chains that are um, managing the risk that exists because of the, of the, of the uncertainty of the materials? All of this is to say that there is innovation in different aspects of the technology, but there is also an understanding that unless we lift the whole thing up together, we are not going to be able to establish an economy around this, and therefore we are not going to be able to actually tackle the carbon footprint of the building industry. The hemp, hemp as a material has existed for a long time, and it has been discussed as a long time as a useful material for buildings. Maybe you have heard of hempcrete or hemp lime, which is the proper way to say it. It has existed in, in Europe, for example, for the last 30 years at least, it has been heralded as a material that can be used. For some reason, it's not happening. It's not a ubiquitous material. We don't build our buildings with hemp lime. So we are trying with this initiative to understand how we can motivate the whole chain from the seed to the city to be able to do this. And we are also in the topic of leapfrogging we are not relying on the existing technology. We want to invent things that are going to push the economy even further. So one of the one of the one example is um, a project that we call the Hemp Retrofit SIPS. Um, the DOE awarded RPI a grant for two million dollars, approximately, and that is still in the negotiation phase, and we're about to begin now. This is developing, in essence, a jacket for a building that is able to keep the heat in um, during the winter and keep the heat out during the summer. This is in order to renew your facade. It is specifically replacing siding for, material, siding for buildings that are built prior to 1980. 
This is about 50%, don't quote, I think it's 50% of the housing in the United States today that require retrofitting according to the United States. The number might be slightly different, but this is more or less it. So this is a three-year project. It involves architects, uh, faculty from architecture, from mechanical engineering, from material science, and from business. And it also involves three industry partners, Introba, which is an engineering and architecture firm, uh, Durasip, which is a, a manufacturer of uh, fiberglass skins, and uh, Hempitecture, which is a manufacturer of this insulation material that you see there. One very uh, positive uh, um, startup in the, uh, in the hemp industry. The second project is a project that is called the Peeling Decorticator. It's a, it's a project that addresses something that is earlier in the supply chain. Um, this is a project that is led by my colleague Dan Wolzik in Mechanical Engineering and MIC, the Manufacturing Innovation Center. There is technology today that exists that extracts fiber from plants, but it's done in a way that damages the fibers. A peeling decorticator is actually um, resembling the way we peel by hand a plant, which is how it's done when you want to extract higher quality fiber, but it's done in an automated way so that it can be introduced in a United States uh, setting. So this is an enabling technology that can exist in order to make even higher quality fiber products out of, uh, out of uh, hemp. I will quote my colleague Dan Wolzik that says that for, synthetics, for synthetic materials we've had like 100 years of chemistry and 100 years of processing in order to derive what we have very high quality plastics from oil for example. With renewable materials, we are still at the very at the paraffin age, at the age of at the age of the lamp that was using the oil, uh, the, the lamps, the street lamp. So there is a long time, there is a long process until we can really figure out how we can extract value from the natural materials we have available, and therefore create circular economies that will. In my opinion, for the United States, it's an opportunity to bring manufacturing back in a completely different way than how it has been happening so far. And also, and also create a circular economy that addresses the issues of climate change as we know them. The, the last project that we are developing is a hemp rebar, a reinforcement, a reinforcement for cement. Um, uh, you might know rebar, it's made out of steel usually, and it corrodes. And because it corrodes, the cement uh, dies, um, the concrete dies prematurely. And because of that, we have to renew. And there is this infrastructure build that you might have heard of that is about making sure that we um, update the infrastructure in the United States. So this is a project that is producing a non-corroding rebar out of hemp and thermoplastic filament that is joined together in, a, in the form of a rope. It looks like the, the thicker section that you see on the bottom um, right there. It goes through a machine that solidifies it and shapes it automatically into, into the rebar, cuts it to length and so on. A good thing about this technology is that it has a physical footprint that is the size of a car. So it's completely different than the size of a factory that you have of, of, of uh, steel and stainless steel rebar, and therefore it can be deployed on site, and therefore you can have other logistical advantages and so on. This is always a thing about when you do, when you do work with uh, sustainability and uh, climate change, and you always, in my opinion, you have to have some advantages that are of direct economic benefit to the people that will invest. Otherwise, it's very difficult for people to to invest on somebody else's problem because everybody thinks of it as somebody else's uh, problem. Um, we have created a company uh, which is a spin-off uh, from RPI. It's called Fiberworks. The mission of this company is to commercialize the IP uh, of all the different things that we have been uh, working on. It is a, a very good candidate for a vertically integrated company, exactly because we are developing technology that are from making textiles all the way to making the products. So we are going that route. This is not a pitch. I'm just uh, 
trying to tell you that in the research to translation, we're trying to keep a continuum within RPI so that we can actually succeed our mission, which is to create a positive impact in society with uh, materials in this case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, now please welcome Dr. Jonathan Dordick, Associate Vice President for the Office of Strategic Alliances and Translation, and the Howard B. Uh, P. Iserman, Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering at RPI, with joint appointments in the Departments of Biomedical Engineering and Biological Sciences, and an adjunct appointment at Rockefeller University. Dr. Dordick is co-director of the Rensselaer Mount Sinai Center for Engineering and Precision Medicine. At RPI, he has served as the Vice President for Research and the Director of the Center for Biotechnology and Interdisciplinary Studies and Department Chair. Dr. Dordick is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Inventors. He is a fellow of the American Chemical Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineers. He received his BA degree in biochemistry and chemistry from Brandeis University and his PhD in biochemical engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Please welcome <coughs> Dr. Dordick. Okay, thanks very much, Matt. Uh, and uh, so, you know, one of the questions that you may have we should have is how do we actually do all the things you just heard about? How do we take these ideas, move them forward, get them out of the university because it doesn't do anybody any good to have things sitting in a university only. Uh, and uh, you know, to be quite honest, the most significant translation we do are the people that come out of the university, like the students and the alumni that then represent the university uh, down the road. So let me talk a little bit about uh, this new Office of Strategic Alliances and Translation, uh, which we stood up literally just several months ago. Uh, the idea is now to kind of bring together a lot of things that were going around the university, finding a way to bring it to, to, you know, to give, give some sort of form and function to it, uh, and then be able to take it out so that the world can see what Rensselaer has been doing. So, maybe. Okay, so, the, and Marty already talked a little bit about this, but there's just several specific parts of the office that we're pull, pulling together. One of them is strategic partnerships and transactions. The deans like this, uh, because this has to do with how do we bring in more industry funding? How do we get us, uh, have a greater set of partnerships with a broader array of uh, programs and, and uh, companies and industries and so forth? and to do it in such a way that we can very quickly get things started so that the research could begin very quickly. Be able to do that really does require intellectual property and tech licensing to be brought together into this outfit and that's what we've been able to do so that everything is in one place and we can get things out the door very quickly. And then the other side of it is what we call realization and commercialization. So how do we then take the research and then bring it forward in the form of new ideas that go out to get licensed, new companies that start, uh, and to get the students and the faculty interested and excited about being able to develop their own technologies, their own ideas, and see it uh, move towards a product or a process. And as part of that, we've, as Marty said, we brought the Severino Center for Technological Entrepreneurship into this office. So, as many of you, you know, we, we had an incubator, uh, and regardless of whether or not you like the term incubator, it doesn't matter, we had one, and we had over 300 companies who were successful, they graduated from the incubator and went on to some sort of successful outcome. Some of them are shown here, uh, and it's only a small part of it. That's what the building looked like. Actually, the building looks the same. Uh, uh, <laughs> the J building, except it doesn't have the incubator center on it. That's the one thing they made a change to the building, they took that off. But anyway, uh, but that old incubator doesn't mean that the idea is old, it just means that we need to do something else. And we need to build something much more broad focused across the institution. So here's what we are now doing within the realization and commercialization. So obviously it all starts with the people at the university, the researchers, the faculty members, the students, 
uh, the ideas that they have. It could be very structured, for example, if it's in a research grant that comes from the federal government, or it could just be some wild ideas that the students might have, and they get together with other students and come up with something that is uh, that, that fills an unmet need. We heard Anquasia do something that has nothing to do with her PhD thesis. And we met this morning about trying to get one of the papers done. But nonetheless, uh, it, uh, but it's an idea that the time is right and it's meeting an important need that we're all worried about. So when you take all that together, what, are, what is it we can provide? What can we allow or enable the university to help the students and the faculty move forward? So it's kind of like a funnel. We're developing what's called Startup X, and we may have a new name for this. We're, we're still getting started. Uh, but it's an innovation fund, uh, and that allows uh, people like you, alumni, friends, others, to come in and put something toward, to the university that allows the university then to promote some of these new ideas and get it out the door. It's before a company starts, it allows the work to be done, without any conflicts or anything like that at the university. And uh, we would provide that capability, that, the, the funding that's necessary, small amounts, uh, depending on the nature of the work, as well as the facilities that the students and the faculty can use. And we have tremendous facilities at the university that would be put to bear. Um, these are milestone-based approaches, so we'll have very clear milestones. Uh, and with that, we'll ultimately have uh, market as well as technological proof of concept. Uh, and to go with it, we're developing what's called the RPI Mentor. Uh, and that's where many of you can play a role as well. Because the mentorship aspect of it is critical. So is the money. But the mentorship is obviously critical for the students and faculty to take their ideas forward. And that goes into the milestone uh, arrangements as well. We have competitions and things like that. We'll help them with the business plan. Maybe we'll take some equity in companies that they start, uh, and maybe it'll be an early exit, but that's okay. The idea is that, and I learned this with one of the first companies I had when the lead investor said, I want the university to have some equity. I said, why do you want that? And they said, simply because the university becomes a partner, not an adversary. And that's something that stuck with me, and I think it makes a significant impact. And ultimately, we can have a launch in which case we will then work with the company and with the outside, perhaps even with, with RPI having a venture fund, along with other funds that exist today, angel and venture networks, uh, that will allow us to ultimately take these ideas and turn them into something that creates value because of what it is that they're doing, the technology, the concepts, the proof of concept that, that turns into a real product. Uh, and as the company goes out, Maybe it'll be in downtown Troy. Maybe there'll be some space, incubator type space in the university itself on the main campus. Ultimately, graduation can go towards uh, going to the, uh, the tech park, for example, where there's plenty of opportunity for expansion. So what I'd like to do now is tell you a little bit about two things, two pathways that exist. And I, I'll use my own, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of my own experience in talking about those pathways. I like to call it whether or not you start a company or not to start a company, maybe there's another approach. And at the university, you have both these opportunities, and there are reasons to do one versus the other. So one is, while dealing with the pandemic, we all know about uh, uh, the challenges that, by the way, still remain, regardless of what people think. Uh, and um, at the time, my lab was actually the lab that developed the, uh, and we didn't develop it, but we implemented the various PCR testing protocols so that we ended up testing about 700,000 people, uh, or 700,000 tests, we should say, uh, at the university during the pandemic. And the idea then was, okay, look, we're doing all this, let's do something else as well. So we, we looked at a number of different things, particularly interesting natural products, that actually was a, were able to very strongly prevent the ability of the virus to infect cells. And so based on that, we started to put some new technologies together, develop some IP. And the idea behind it was, wouldn't it be nice if you could have a nasal spray, for example, not a vaccine, but a nasal spray that would act like a, an invisible mask so that you can go to whatever you want, like sitting here today, uh, or an airplane, or wherever you want to go, and at least just you know, take nasal spray something that would not be toxic. 
And one of the things that we found through a number of different projects, I won't go through the details of how we ultimately got here, uh, was that we found an interesting compound from seaweed. In this case, particularly brown seaweed, which my only major experience with brown seaweed is either eating it when I'm in Japan or at the beach in Florida where we used to have a place and all this crap came out on shore, which was just miserable to look at and smelled, uh, but that was brown seaweed. Uh, and from that, we actually had a compound that was able to block the infection in a Petri dish. It also blocked complete 100% the infection in a mouse model, uh, and that just shows some of the data, which I won't go through, but it worked extremely well and showed that not only do we get things to work in an in vitro environment, but in an actual animal environment. These were humanized mice so that they actually had the uh, receptor that is that the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uses to get into the human cells. This was actually in a mouse, prophylactic mouse model uh, with a nasal spray. And so we started a company called Lavage, looking more broadly at sustainable antivirals. These are not synthetic drugs. These are actually taking compounds out of seaweed. I isolated a very potent compound, uh, which is the polysaccharide. So it, it's something you'll pretty much eat. Uh, and um, we're prioritizing a number of things. Uh, nasal sprays, oral uses, lozenges, and so forth. Both long-term and near-term uh, op opportunities here. Some may not require much uh, in the way of uh, regulatory approval, because again, it, it's a generally regarded as safe molecule. Uh, but some, even in the nasal spray, might require some sort of, of, uh, of uh, human testing, clinical testing, and so forth. Uh, and um, looking at generating revenue a number of different ways, from li out licensing to some companies, whether it's natural product companies, whether it's even pharma companies, uh, as well as generating uh, our, our own uh, sales through some fairly simple uh, pathways to the market. So that's one way that you can do something based on things that come out of a research lab. Doesn't need a lot of investment to get going. But there's sometimes you end up doing research that needs a huge amount of investment. And that often happens in a real pharmaceutical, something that is gonna go through, that, that is a drug today perhaps, and you make it a different way, but has a very large market. And this goes back to 2008, when we started looking at addressing the problem, uh, myself and my colleague Bob Linhart, who's a heparin expert, at the problem with the contamination of the heparin supply chain due to uh, the contamination of the supply from China. Now heparin is, as you know, an anticoagulant, it's the most uh, widely sold uh, anticoagulant, and the low molecular weight heparins that come from it all come from the same source, from pig intestine. And our idea was, let's get away from the pig, let's do something that's GMP-based, let's do a real pharmaceutical manufacturing of heparin. And we started down that path. Now, it's extremely complicated because heparin is not a single molecule, it's a polysaccharide. Uh, the way they get it from the pig is actually very disgusting, so I won't show any pictures of that. But what it, uh, it results in is a long process of ultimately cleaning it up and then putting it into the vials of heparin. And that process has been a concern to the FDA for quite some time. So, this is when you wouldn't want to do a startup because the amount of investment needed to get through that, nobody would ever invest in it. So we ended up getting a number of pharma partners that came in to, to work with us. So Heparin, just as a, uh, an example, the $7 billion market. Uh, we have gone through the pre-IND. The IND is in preparation right now, so we hope it will go through in this year. Uh, it will be a minimal uh, a clinical trial because it actually is something that we have generated that is both biologically and chemically equivalent to the pig heparin, but using a biological approach to get there. A $100 million facility is under construction right now for the early phase, both clinical and early phase sales. Uh, and the investment so far overall, not just to RPI, but within the companies, has exceeded $50 million. So that doesn't include the capital. So that's an example of where you probably wouldn't do a startup company to get involved in that. But the opportunities of the university are such that we can do that at RPI. So the entire early stage development was done at RPI. And our goal is to go from the heparin that you get or the doctor's offices have and to convert that into the bioengineered heparin. And if you're gonna use heparin, you won't know 
that actually came from a laboratory because it'll be exactly the same as the heparin that, that comes from the pig intestine. But it's completely controllable as a bioprocess. So that is in a couple examples where you would start a company, and you heard a few already uh, before me, as well as when the university has the opportunity to do something that even a startup venture can't do. And this new office is really going to promote that opportunity across from the university out to the real world. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, finally, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening. Dawn Fitzgerald is a member of the class of 1987, and as I mentioned, a proud RPI parent uh, for the classes of 2018 and 2022. Dawn is CTO of Shark Ninja, where she leads the advanced technology development for Shark and Ninja product lines. She has served in leadership positions at American Family, Schneider Electric Data Center Operations, IBM, Motorola, and at numerous high-tech startups. A springboard woman, entre woman entrepreneur, startup funding recipient, she co-founded and was vice president of energy, uh, engineering for a chip company where she designed digital signal processors for image processing. Dawn is a member of the Rensselaer School of Engineering Leadership Council and the Rensselaer New England Executive Council. She received her bachelor's degree in electrical, computer, and systems engineering from RPI in her master's degree in electrical engineering and an MBA from MIT. Welcome, Dawn. Thank you. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? There we go. Perfect. Thank you. So first, before I begin, uh, I just want to say, wow, this has been amazing, right? Thank you to Marty. Thank you for the speakers here today. Uh, let's give another round of applause for all of this from RPI. It's very exciting to see. And I really feel it because, as you'll see in my bio in a minute, I really am, have my whole career seated, of course, at RPI, been one that wants to translate and take that new idea and make it into a reality. And that's been something that my whole career has been driven by. How do I make this real? What a great idea. How do we make it real? So, but first, we're going to start with the big pictures. <laughs> big pictures on the right. Uh, I, uh, we have family. Can you still hear me? There we go. We have a legacy family, uh, three generations. My uncle, actually, Paul Bakeman, is an RPI alum, three degrees. He beats us all. Uh, and he's the handsome gentleman holding the teddy bear on the far right picture there. Uh, my two sons, Christopher and Stephen. Uh, the two graduates, of course, Stephen 2018 and Christopher 2022, both biomedical engineering students. And the 2022 one is hard, right? That was COVID. For all those parents who've been through that with students during COVID, not easy. But our, I got to say, RPI did a great, great job, really did. It's very impressive. Um, going through, and by the way, that's three generations, four engineers and six RPI degrees. <laughs> so when I'm asked about my journey with RPI, it's like, well, it's my whole life, beginning to end. But we um, really have enjoyed and we got a chance to go up and get those legacy pins for some of the, uh, all of the different alum at the different generations. Career-wise, I am a CTO at Shark Ninja, and you can see from my background, I've been with large companies. I've also been with high-tech startups and then large companies. So I went big company, small company, big company, had that sandwich. And some of the most important things, I think, uh, that I want to say to the team at RPI that is doing this whole program, because Marty was saying, well, what, what do you think? And what is your advice? Keep going. Wow. This is fantastic. This is exactly what we need, not only as entrepreneurs out there trying to get our ideas kicked off and going, but also for the enterprises, the large companies. We need some help to find those ideas, to bring them in. I've been in many large companies like Schneider Electric, which had a, has a lot of acquisitions per year. How do you find those companies? How do you find those ideas? How do you bring them in and grow them into something very tangible for your business? So I'm very, very excited to see that. 
Um, I'll also mention quickly some of the work I'm doing, of course, the Executive Leadership Council for the Dean of Engineering, Dean Gardet, so thank you. And then also the New England Council, as mentioned here. And I've been very involved in, at MIT, in addition, uh, in machine learning, AI work over the past years, and also in their operations lab. And what I wanted to share today uh, with, the, with the group here, because of this concept of translation, innovation, and entrepreneurship, is a key message that I've brought out even just last year to both a group of enterprise executives and the same message to a group of entrepreneurs. And this uh, specific me message is about how we're gonna be leveraging generative AI as a tool in our companies to make that creation of taking things from a seed and bringing it to the development, how do we make that go faster for us? And so this, I'm just gonna give you so, a few thoughts that I shared at those events, but I think they're very, very relevant to anyone who's doing innovation, whether it be at an enterprise level, whether it's an entrepreneur, and it's something that we need to be keeping in mind for all functions in all of our organizations. Uh, the AI landscape has been changing. If anyone's been involved in AI for many, many years, we now call it traditional AI. That's the old stuff, right? We, we now have generative AI, which has hit and gone tremendous uh, impact and change. I'm expecting almost everyone in here has been involved or tried using uh, generative AI tools out there. With, with the group we have here today. But very important, the power of AI is now friendly, easy, and available to the masses. And what that means is as you are doing your entrepreneurial work, your innovative work, et cetera, and you are doing some of the transversal, so Alex, you were saying you're very transversal across the different departments, you should be seeing use of these kinds of tools to speed things up everywhere in all those different functions. So one of the things that I also like to highlight is the fact that combining traditional AI and generative AI is happening and it's happening rapidly. And you see a plethora of AI as a service companies out there that will really customize for you and help you bring things up and get them running. Hopefully you've seen this type of summary before, but this is really showing how rapidly, uh, rapidly this has been adopted really the fastest ever adopted of any technology. Now, I know we're gonna all get in arguments about that, but the bottom line is that it is, you can see in the graphs, the explosion onto the scene where you have five days to one million users, two months to 100 million users. My key message to those both groups, the entrepreneurs and the enterprise leaders, was this is our Darwinian moment, adopt or perish. So this is, you know, like, cell phones back in the day when they weren't there and then they were, you have to adopt, you have to use them now, they're an indispensable tool. Same thing with all of the generative AI tools out there. I'm not taking you all through this, so everybody take a breath, but <laughs> this is uh, an example that I worked on with my engineering teams and specifically it's showing us our software development life cycle. You can put product development life cycle in there. You could change the words and say marketing plan. You could put in the words HR program. The bottom line is you can go to every single step in your process in your company, small or big, and say how can I use this tool to leverage and save time. And I'm predicting 30 to 40% reduction of time to get something done. It's crazy. It's like you're really, really making a big impact. So how do we get these tools? I'm, you know, if I'm very busy in my lab developing something, I really don't want to learn about that tool. But yes, we can, and it's very important for us to do that. And the last thing I'll leave you with is, because um, I do have a security background too, <laughs> very important. Uh, I presented this in an AI Trends column um, for an executive leadership. And this particular uh, article, I did four articles. This was the one, the last one, and it was on ethics. And the concept here is we have a mandatory guardrails that we have to put in place for any AI, whether it's generative AI or traditional AI or AI as a service. No matter where you're getting your AI, where you go shopping for your AI, you have to put this trust triad in place. People are very, very good at security now. 
because it's been around for a long time. Uh, not so, they're pretty good with privacy too, but privacy is tricky, right? You need to be able to do reduction and make sure when you're, we, we were just talking about that earlier, how, how do we make sure we've got those privacy? And then responsible use is really that ethical question. And so these are the guardrails that whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're an enterprise, you have to make sure when you're using this incredibly powerful, critical tool that you're also putting these guardrails in and making sure that you have that trust triad in place. And that's it. I'd like to go ahead and now invite our uh, panelists to join us and our president as well on stage. Please uh, join us up on stage. Um, Dawn will lead our panel discussion. She's going to start out with two to three questions. Um, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Uh, we have staff members with um, uh, microphones, so they will, um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll have a staff member uh, bring over a microphone for you, and you can ask your question. But first, we'll start with Dawn with some questions for our panelists. Yes. Dawn, please. All right. So I absolutely, uh, like I said, I was, I was thrilled with this session today. My favorite question when I was going through, because we were looking at different, what's, what's in the imp impactful piece? And I've already heard it here a few times this evening. So you had it in your presentation, and I love how you said to do or not to do, right? Fantastic, John, because that's the uh, Steve Jobs quote about it's as important what we don't do versus what we do do. No? We still do it. We still do it. It's a different way of doing it. <laughs> well, you don't take it that next level. But how can we help create the future entrepreneurial role models? And for that question on those role models, both of those folks that are currently entrepreneurs or those that have been entrepreneurs, and then from our conversation, Akisha, we were talking about, gee, how can we get those role models also to be providing some of that mentorship that you mentioned? So this is the shameless plug for all of us alum. Let's get back there and help and, and see what we can do. But you've got to tell us, what, what does that look like in your mind? Well, I think it's, it's broadly engagement. Uh, we would like to see everyone here uh, and, and of course at many places want to engage with the university. Uh, that will be, you know, with students. Uh, the ideas, the life experiences you have, and the ideas that, that have come, that you've taken forward, uh, both the good and the bad, uh, and um, the things that were successful and things that weren't successful. Sometimes the successful ones can't translate into helping somebody uh, because they just, yeah. you know, they come out and, and you did whatever, but sometimes the things that, you know, almost worked, but you reflect on it a decade later and say, now I think I know what we could have done differently. Provide that information to the students, to the faculty. I think that would be you know, vital. Um, resources are needed too. Uh, you, know, you can have all the ideas you want, but if we can't build what I laid out there in terms of being able to provide these, uh, the ability for the students and the faculty to have access to things to do. Uh, the facilities, the uh, uh, support to take an idea to the next level, working with uh, mentors that could help them identify what are the milestones, both technical and market. Uh, I think all of that kind of has to come together. Um, and then ideally we get more and more students that are driven by the desire to not just learn what they're in a degree that they're going to get, but want to have that, that always asking the question, what else can I do? There's something else that's bugging me. I want to do something more. I want to do something different. I want to solve some problems that are going to help humanity. That's what we'd like to get. Yeah, that's great. Marty, you want to hit that one too? Because I, no, I, I think, think it's a, it. oh, yeah. come on now. <laughs> that, that, that mentoring piece, I love that. Yeah. All right. So key technologies that we're focusing on, which ones do you think we should be focusing on to promote 
with research opportunities, RPI research opportunities and innovation. What do you think would be the most critical areas for those entrepreneur opportunities? Yeah, I would say what we're focused on really is, you know, the size of our institution is such that we can't do everything. Yeah. And so what we're trying to do is focus on research areas where we can, what I would characterize as create unfair advantage. Um, uh, sometimes that's through creating partnerships, sometimes that's leveraging uh, um, uh, assets that are proximate. I mean, what Alex talked about is a great example. I mean, being in down, down in New York City, both for what he's doing and what we're doing in precision medicine, mm -hmm. allows us to kind of focus in in areas where through partnerships, we can create a whole that's greater than the sum of the parts. And I think mm -hmm. that will define a lot of where I think RPI will go in terms of its research agenda, which will then lead to some of the uh, translation opportunities. Great, yeah, okay. And then the last one I'll hit here and then we'll, we'll go to the audience and see if anybody else has questions. I'm really interested in ways that we can do that, encourage and partnership. And when we say partnership, what are we thinking about with partnership? Where are the boundaries on that partnership? So how do we encourage it? And what, what are those partnerships? I think you want to take a stab at that Yes. One? OK, so um, I'm going to tell you a, a, a personal story. I, I did not study at RPI, which makes me think twice. Maybe I should have studied at RPI. Um, I joined RPI six years ago. and. Um, I immediately started working on the on the some of the projects that I showed you. Within a couple of months, I discovered that RPI is very good at creating uh, relationships between faculty and students. It's 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 not a typical environment, and you are RPI alone, I imagine. No? So you must have witnessed this in your areas. So there is, there is a natural tendency for collaboration to happen. The, um, the VP of research says the, the barriers for collaboration are very low. This is a very unique situation in a university because we can talk, we do not shoot down each other's ideas, we get to, we get to uh, actually push each other, like to, to help each other grow through, through the work that we do together. So this is a kind of partnership that I think makes RPI strong. And if you have witnessed this as, a, as part of this, what I think we should be doing better is increase the, the net of this partnership. Because uh, people like yourselves that have experience and have been, yourselves are entrepreneurs or the, your business owners and you have your personal experiences, you can bring in this kind of this kind of approach to RPI and, cre and create this continuum from a student that has a brilliant idea until the translation happens in the in the real world. This partnership is like a it's like, it's almost like a family. I think it's almost like a like a, a big continuum of exchange. And I think we inside RPI traditionally has been it has been happening very well. I'm very happy that I am working there. Actually, I have to tell you, and and. To continue this, to not to make to not make the RPI a border, a, a boundary, but to actually make it a continuum towards outside and continue these partnerships, invite people in, make more of those events going out, will create this continuum to be further. And I think that will enable translation to happen in a more seamless way. Yeah, you, you mentioned the uh, working in t with teams internally, yes. and then Kwesi, you had talked about that too, about how you were able to get a group together yeah. that internally. So how, what was the most powerful for you from that? Yeah, so, can you hear me? Okay, yeah, yeah, we got you. <laughs> okay um, so it started initially with the grant. And one of the things with the training grant is you have to be advised by um, two people from different departments. So it's forcing you to be able to communicate in a way that you may not have before because it's someone that may not exactly know um, the research you're doing or the jargon associated with that. Mm -hmm. And then at first it's uncomfortable because you're like, okay, I don't know what to expect. And then before you know it, 
I'm talking to other uh, students and I'm like, oh, you're not co-advised, like that's unfortunate. Like I have all these opportunities, things like that. And they're like, oh, maybe I should look into that. It sparks that curiosity. And I think for it to initially start structured and okay, this is a requirement, but then it starts to branch out and now you're no longer intimidated to get outside of your comfort zone and that's through partnering. I think a lot of it is just seeing it be done mm -hmm. and then you're able to be uh, motivated. And now, even within one of our bu buildings, CBIS, we started having programs from Lally. And scientists are now starting to see a business conversation. And now they want to engage. And I think that's how what fosters partnerships. And then you start to see the benefits of those partnerships. Yeah. All right, do we want to take some questions from the audience? Anybody with a question for anyone on the panel? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you all for a wonderful uh, introduction to what's going on at the school. I would like to ask about the mentorship program that was briefly mentioned in one of the presentations. I forget the precise name of it. Um, but I guess I'm just trying to figure out more about sort of the level, who's teaching who. Um, I know that when I was at the school, there was a STEM mentorship program that was primarily for first year students who were just being introduced to their subjects. And I guess I'd like to know if this mentorship program is more like that, except for more business-like ventures, or if it's more advanced, if it's for people who sort of already have their foot in the door. Um, so what do you have to say about the structure of this, this new mentor program? Oh, I, Who wants to take I, it? I, I'm, I'm wondering if that's the RPI mentor that I had mentioned. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it doesn't yet exist. Okay. <laughs> so it's very early stage. Um, and, and the idea, though, is, is that, that I, I look at that as kind of the pre-venture part of the office that, that we stood up. Because that's where the ideas that are coming out of the labs, ideas coming out of uh, student projects, things like that, can move forward. So we want to provide some support. We want to provide the facilities that they can use. We want to help them through any of the IP. Uh, we're not going to charge them right away. Don't worry about that. Uh, <laughs> and, and at the same time, we're going to Stand, stand up at this, you know, and we're beginning to do this now, a network uh, of mentors. Uh, and ideally, each person or each group, each team, is going to have at least a couple mentors. One that would know the technology area. Another one who understands the business side of it. Uh, you know, and they're going to contribute their time and energy to support these, uh, these fledgling ideas. And, and then, you know, they'll see that reach the point where the company may go out and actually a company gets formed. Uh, you know, so that's what we see. I mean, there are so many mentoring opportunities at RPI now anyway, yeah. uh, but this is kind of a new, new one. To and, me, that's one of the partnerships, by the way. Yeah, and I think I would yeah. say that it's also important to recognize there's mentoring of the idea the, and the <coughs> enterprise. There's also mentoring to the individual. Huge. And so I think it's important to not lose sight of the right. fact that in order to help folks like Alex and Akasha and all of us is, is sort of helping them build the capacity to execute. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I think, uh, I mean, I've, I've had the honor of being a mentor in many different uh, mm -hmm. places. MIT, one of them, the mm -hmm. VMS, Venture Mentoring Service. And it is that about that mentor, because you will have serial entrepreneurs. The mentee is the one that you're trying to make sure they learn from it. And mm -hmm. even if they end up doing a second or a third or a fourth, they're still looking for that mentorship and support. That's great. There was another one over here. Yeah. Thank you all so much for your time tonight. Uh, my name is John Spangenberger. Uh, I practice intellectual property law, so very excited about all the IP talk tonight. I can barely sit still. Um, but as a patent attorney, I work with engineers all day, and um, when I was getting my electrical engineering degree, I'm not sure I ever, ever even heard the word patent. Um, and so my question is, I'm wondering if there are any intentions to add uh, intellectual property basics to uh, the standard curriculum. 
Uh, Dr. Dordick, it sounds like there are plenty of resources available for uh, innovators who have ideas and go out and seek these resources. But you know, what about the other 90, 95% of students who uh, go on to become engineers as the innovators of tomorrow, but don't even really understand uh, what a patent is or what steps they should be taking to protect their IP? Yeah, so, um, so, so just very basic on that. Um, one of the key people in our IP office, uh, and, and we've initiated this just in the last few months, is making a point to be able to go around and go to various classes and give a lecture about IP. Uh, and our goal is that it's, that and one person can't do all of it, but our goal is that, that every student at one point or another during their time at RPI will be exposed to what this is. Uh, and so we have somebody who's actually, a, 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 he's a patent attorney who works in our IP office, uh, is gonna go around and, and has begun to do that. He's probably given five or six uh, lectures at five or six different classes. Uh, and um, you know that's just the beginning. So yes, we wanna bring that in. Not because people are gonna, most of them are not gonna go do IP, you know, they're not gonna file a patent, but just the knowledge about it gets them thinking about what they could do. I wonder That's if you great. guys have any thoughts on that. IP yeah, I um, I would say it's definitely needed. I think even starting with an idea and then getting mentorship on how to execute that idea. Sometimes IP is like this little gray cloud that you doesn't you don't realize is there and it's hovering over you and then you're like who do I talk to um, how can I see this through what's the first step so having um, some type of structured educational program on that would definitely be beneficial mm -hmm. Alex any thoughts um, I think it's important to have a, a education on um, intellectual property I think it's linked very well together with understanding what is a a business model that you're trying to develop. What, what does this mean? What does it mean to have a value proposition? And through the value proposition idea, uh, work all the way to IP, which is a, you know, a, a byproduct, let's say. I mean, it's an important thing, but for the student, the idea of understanding what is the value proposition of what they're working on that will end up in IP is something that they need to be taught. I, uh, in a previous school I was, I was, um, I had a, I had the students go through a series of workshops. They were learning all kinds of tools, uh, like uh, drawing tools, uh, prototyping things, um, um, electronics. And I had a class on uh, business model and I had uh, how to create a business model. And, and I had a session on, on IP specifically. The person that was doing IP was doing that. Every time they were going through these workshops, which were like two or three weeks long, the students were asked, now that you know this technology or you have engaged with this knowledge, what do you think about the project that you're developing? How does it push you forward? And this series of exercises showed them different perspectives of, um, of this is something that we could be doing, for example, at RPI at, uh, within departments with their own unique skills. And also, since we're in the biomedical, biotechnology space, regulatory, I was like, I need FDA approval for this, <laughs> which was another layer, so that's mm -hmm. something as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, yes, go ahead. I'm Dana Hall, class of 82, um, electrical engineering. Speaking of IP, I was just curious, um, as an alumni who might have a few ideas up his sleeve, how would I go about presenting my ideas to either possibly donate to the, to the, to the school? What would be the process? Who would I contact? What a great question. Uh, John? Well, <laughs> me. <laughs> Here's the process. <laughs> and and, and we've, had, we've had a number of people along those lines, looking to donate and all that. Um, it's not very common, uh, but, um, but you, we can talk about that. <laughs> Sounds good. But I love the theme there because I think we need to be looking as alum, we need to look back and say, how can we give back the idea about the patent? I mean, maybe you could have a course or be a guest speaker 
your ideas, right? Bringing those forward. To, to me, it's very exciting, the concept of being mentors and signing up alum to be mentors in the space. Giving that back is very, very rewarding. All right, we got one more, way over there. There you go. You, sir, with your hand up. <laughs> Keys, thank you. Uh, I'm a parent of a freshman, um, so I didn't go to RPI. Um, uh, my question was on this translation. Um, normally, it's not so easy because there is a lot of competition out there from different schools and individual universities. Um, so are you having a, a, a group of, there is an incubation and there is an accelerator. The accelerator typically takes it much faster. Uh, because we did a project, my background is from Harvard, and uh, we know the challenges, we, we came across many schools. So does RPI also try to attract faculty so they can also become a CEO of a company, uh, use this vehicle to attract top talent from other universities and give them an opportunity to run? companies, because many schools don't do that. That's great. And, uh, and are you planning to also partner with other universities to create uh, a JV uh, in this scheme? Uh, what was that, a J? A, a joint venture. JV. Oh, joint venture. Yeah. Well, I guess what I would say is, um, I think uh, what we're increasingly seeing is that uh, the faculty are really keen on seeing their ideas go out and have impact in the world. You know, if you go back 20 or 30 years, it was often tech transfer was the PhD student graduates and goes to work for the company. Um, and increasingly, you're seeing large companies encouraging the universities to create a startup, and then they, they participate with it, maybe acquire it downstream. So um, certainly in the disciplines at a place like RPI, where those ideas, it's not curiosity-driven research, perhaps, which is you know, uh, driving the frontiers of science, but it's really an applied thing. You'll see that the, there's a pull from the external partners, be they industry or whatever, a pull to see the university start a company. And, and as a consequence, what we're seeing, I'd say, at RPI and at other institutions is, is a means that the faculty and the students need to learn how to go through that process of translation. And, and so I think that's happening partly because of the external pull on it. And, and so I think uh, then that's something certainly that we want to support. So, uh, you know, I mean, all of a sudden you get a new junior faculty member and they've got to understand what a capitalization chart is. And they've got to understand what dilution means. And they've got to learn all these things. And part of what we have to do is support them in that. And, and I think that's, that happens naturally. And with respect to joint ventures, I mean, one of the things that we're trying to do uh, as part of our strategic uh, planning at RPI is something called regional engagement, which is that the question really is, can we partner with enterprises in our region, and our region can extend to New York City, mm -hmm. uh, to, to create something where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, where you know, maybe John's lab can't do it all, but maybe in partnership with Mount Sinai and with their massive patient database or something else, that partnership creates those opportunities. So we're very much on receipt for that. I mean, in my experience in 41 years at MIT is a lot of what has translated to, you know, what is Kendall Square today is a result of institutions like the hospitals, Harvard and MIT working together. So it very much has to be part of the formula. Underscoring that partnership again. That's great. Love that. Okay. I think we have to be a wrap now. Yes, okay. Matt, back well, to you. Thank you all again. Please join me a round of applause. Uh, so we have uh, plenty of time. Uh, so please enjoy uh, some networking, some food. Uh, enjoy our panelists. will be here for uh, additional questions. So again, thank you all very much uh, for joining us this evening.